One, black holes have this fascination because they're this mysteriously dense objects, but to a physicist, they're very significant. How would you begin to explain their meaning? Well, black holes are a wonderful thing. They're a wonderful prediction of uh, the Einstein theory of gravity, which is a theory of space-time and how space-time curves and how the geometry of space-time affects the motion of particles and so on. However, gravity is additive. So when you have lots of matter, uh, the forces of gravity add and add yeah. and so on. And gravity then gets, could get very strong and it could cause a, a star to collapse and form a black hole. And we have some evidence that this is happening. In, this has happened in our universe and there are black holes out there. And what's a black hole? So a black hole is a region uh, in space-time that is surrounded by a horizon. So a horizon is a funny feature, yeah. which uh, is a region of space-time which is perfectly smooth and perfectly fine. So if you cross it, you don't feel anything special. <laughs> However, if you cross it, you can never come back out. So if you cross the horizon of a black hole, there's no way you can escape. You will be crashed into a singularity, which is a region of very strong curvature in the interior, where all the matter of the star that collapses is concentrated. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what the black hole is. So all, now, that, all the matter of the entire star is right. concentrated in an extremely in, in, small space in the center of this region. Right. But the rest of the region is kind of empty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that, exactly. And well, black holes have very interesting consequences for astrophysics. Mm. So uh, they exist when stars collapse, there are some black holes in the center of galaxies. Some, it and, maybe help form the galaxies because they're in the center yeah, and yeah. create structure. Exactly. There are various, uh, let's say, astrophysical applications of black holes, or they're important for astrophysics and for the history of galaxies and mm -hmm. so on. But black holes are also important for understanding quantum gravity because um, the whole mass of the star is co concentrated in a very tiny region. And when you have lots of matter concentrated on a very small region, uh, quantum effects become important. In the same way that quantum effects are important for an atom, which is a very small thing, mm -hmm. quantum effects are important at the singularity. Um, and so these quantum effects imply some very strange things, and things that naively contradict the picture of uh, of black holes according to the classical theory. Mm. So in part, the most surprising thing is that they imply that the black hole will slowly evaporate. Quantum mechanics says yeah. that, the, that the black hole can evaporate because quantum effects, whereas classical general right. relativity right. says that nothing can escape, it's very right. compacted right. and it's the right. densest right. thing you can imagine. Yeah, when you have a space-time that is changing, this, this background that changes creates fluctuations, creates small perturbations in the fields and in the quantum fields. And so this arises quantum particles that are emitted yeah. from the black hole. So these particles could be photons, could be just radiation, uh, could be gravitons, so the quantum of gravity, and <laughs> neutrinos. So all these particles could be emitted from, from the black hole. And so what this implies is that the black hole is losing energy. It's emitting something. Yeah. While according to the classical theory, everything should fall into the black hole. So here we see some, some tension. So there is some tension between classical and quantum. And if you uh, calculate what this radiation is, uh, sort of to the leading approximation, or just in the simplest way, possible way, which is what uh, Hawking did in the 70s, um, you find that this radiation is completely thermal. So thermal means that it's random. Random, uh, it's very random. It contains no quantum information. Um, and however, according to the rules of quantum mechanics, uh, quantum information uh, has to be preserved. So if you knew what fell into the black hole, you should know what comes out of the black hole. So this cannot be completely random in a thermal way. It should only have the randomness of quantum mechanics, <laughs> which contains some information in it. There is quantum information. And you should have that. Otherwise, the rules of quantum mechanics uh, would be wrong and would need to be changed. And so it, this is an important question. So do we need to modify the rules of quantum mechanics when we include mm. gravity or not? Mm. Um, and some people argued, uh, so Hawking in particular argued that one should modify uh, the rules of quantum mechanics in, presence, in the yeah. presence of black holes. Um, on the other hand, uh, people from, let's say, the string theory community, who, who, uh, which, um, who have been trying to construct the theory of quantum gravity based on strings and so on, uh, hold this quantum principle as sacred. So in the sense that we are, we're not modifying quantum mechanics. Um, 
we might modify the nature of space-time, but we don't want to modify <laughs> quantum mechanics. And one of the main reasons is we don't know how to modify it. So the simplest <laughs> approach is to, well, let's uh, suppose quantum mechanics is not modified, and let's try to make a theory of space-time and quantum gravity and so on. And so the black hole is a very good laboratory for understanding this problem, a very good theoretical laboratory. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, make small black holes or black holes that are small enough so as uh, to see these effects. If you had a very small black hole, you could see this radiation coming out. Uh, mm. But the black holes that nature produces for us are, are too big, <laughs> and this uh, radiation is very small. It's a very small effect. But nevertheless, it's a very important problem for thinking about quantum gravity. So if you have a theory of quantum gravity, uh, you can test it on black holes. So you should describe black holes in a consistent way, uh, according to the rules of quantum mechanics. Now, how does the holographic principle figure into this in terms of uh, the, mm -hmm. the application of black holes? Right. So the holographic principle says that the, you should be able to describe whatever happens in a region of space-time in terms of uh, a number of degrees of freedom or quantum bits uh, that is proportional to the area of this region, as opposed to the volume of this region. So it implies a certain reduction in the number of, uh, of quantum information or quantum degrees of freedom you need to describe a system. Um, and one of the earliest indications for this principle is that if you compute the entropy of a black hole, which is uh, the which measure is, of the disorder. We, exactly. So the entropy is the measure of the disorder, it's the measure of uh, how many quantum bits you need to describe a system, how many degrees of freedom, if you wish. Because the uh, more disorder, the more information you exactly, need to exactly, describe yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's not yeah. simple. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and this, this disorder or this number of degrees of freedom is proportional to the area of the black hole horizon. So we saw before the black hole horizon plays a very important role in right. the classical description of black holes. It also plays a very important description in the quantum description because it tells us what the amount of information enclosed in the black hole should be. Um, and since it's proportional to the area and not to the volume, people thought, uh, well, Toft and Saskin thought that, well, uh, perhaps it's a general feature of quantum gravity that uh, the number of degrees of freedom you need is proportional to, always to the area of a surface and not to the volume. And using the tools of string theory, uh, we managed to construct specific examples where you can see that in certain space times, uh, the amount of quantum bits you need is proportional to the surface. And so you describe a whole region of space time in terms of degrees of freedom that live on the, on the boundary of this space-time. So you're describing everything in the sense that's there it, uh, on yeah. just the surface and the boundary as right. opposed to the volume, right. which, right. which in our ordinary way of thinking right. sounds counterintuitive because right. you would think there's a lot of things in the volume that there's too much in there to be described on the, yeah. on, on the yeah. surface yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But yeah. you're able to describe all the information of what's inside just on the surface. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it's something that we have trouble doing using the, the volume description as opposed to this description in terms right. of the area right. of something that lives on the surface. And so the advantage of this description that lives on the surface is that uh, we don't have to talk about what space-time is. Space-time is some dynamical thing that emerges out of the interactions right, right. Uh, of particles. It's sort of similar to, to the surface of a lake. You say, when you look at the surface of a lake, we think of a very well-defined surface, right? Yeah. Either under the lake or over the lake yeah. and so on. But when you look at it in, with very high resolution, you see water molecules coming in and out, and there, is, yeah. there isn't a very well-defined surface. Yeah. So a surface is an effective concept that emerges at long distances, uh -huh. but doesn't have an intrinsic uh, description. I see. I see. And the picture of space-time that we get using uh, these holographic theories is similar, that space-time uh, is something that emerges at long distances. And when you describe it microscopically, you describe it in terms of these, let's say, molecules. And one of the surprising things is that these molecules don't live in the, in the I mean, this volume. They live on the surface. It's a completely different uh, degree of freedom. And that's why it can be studied in a black hole. Right, yeah, so it's particularly useful for black holes. So if you have a black hole, then you can uh, understand its uh, entropy or the number of degrees of freedom as arising from particles that live on the area. Of the, and you get something proportional to the area because precisely of this holographic principle. You've done some remarkable mm -hmm. work, and uh, in particular, using black holes. So right. mm -hmm. try to explain it to me as simple as you can. <laughs> well, this was always using uh, this holographic idea of this idea that you have particles on the boundary describing the interior. Mm -hmm. And so you can understand properties of the black hole, like the amount of information or disorder enclosed in a black hole using uh, these ideas. In particular, um, this theory that lives on the boundary 
is very similar to the theories we use for, for particle physics. So it's a well, very well-defined mm. quantum theory. It mm. respects the laws of quantum mechanics. Mm. And so it, res it conserves information. It, uh, so if a black hole forms and evaporates, information will be preserved. Oh. Uh, because it's a well-known, well let's say, quantum theory. Um, and so in this way, we, one is able to answer this question of whether black holes preserve information or not. And one is answering it saying that quantum mechanics emerges triumphant, <laughs> and quantum mechanics is preserved. Uh, and so, so basically, a black hole has been utilized to show the, uh, the, 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 the power and mm -hmm. the consistency and the triumph of yeah. quantum mechanics. Yeah, that's right. And well, also of, of string theory, that the fact that string theory originally was uh, um, made as a theory of small fluctuations of space-time, so right. small ripples of space-time, uh, but even when you have big deformations like uh, uh, as you have in a black hole, string theory can still describe these things and in a consistent quantum way. So it's a powerful test also on string theory. And so it's a very nice achievement of the theory of quantum gravity. Uh, and of course, in the future, we'd like to apply similar ideas for describing the Big Bang. But, well, that's really for the future. <laughs>